Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Zoom Church. By now you know the drill. We're going to keep you muted until coffee hour. You uh, can toggle between speaker and gallery view, and feel free to use the chat. Before we begin our worship service, we have a brief and exciting announcement from the building committee. Mary, take it away. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mary Dupree, and I'm here to give you an update about our capital campaign. Three years ago, the congregation started to consider how, where, and if we wanted to grow, how to serve the community, and how to meet our facilities needs. After many small group discussions, surveys, and meetings by the entire congregation, we identified three primary goals improved accessibility to all facilities for all congregants, improved and expanded space for gatherings and for our religious exploration program, and improved and expanded seating in the sanctuary. Other high priorities were safety, maintaining the aesthetics of our church building, and using as much green technology as possible. The overarching commitment was that we stand up and show our souls to the larger community. Based on all this, the board appointed a building committee which worked with architect Lawrence Rose to create plans for a new RE addition and a remodel of the existing church building and the finance committee to develop a fundraising plan. The congregation approved the draft architectural plans and a base fundraising goal of $1.68 million. The great news is that we will be opening bids for construction on Tuesday, and we have a hearing for city permits on September 29th. Over the next few weeks, we will give you updates. We are updating our uh, information on the UUCP website, and we're hoping to plan a virtual meeting where we can give you more details and um, answer your questions. Keep an eye out for our news. This is an exciting time. Thank you. It sure is. Exciting times. Exciting times. So when we're together, we, we sometimes do this thing where I speak and you say after me. Um, I'm going to miss the echo, but we're going to do it anyway. So please repeat after me. It is. It is good. It is good to be. It is good to be here together. It is good to be here together albeit virtually, on this morning when the world has broken our hearts yet again. This morning we were actually meant to have a virtual guest in our pulpit, a pre-recorded sermon provided by my friend and colleague, the Reverend Dana Worsnop, and I was supposed to take the Sunday off, but I found as I struggled to come to terms with the death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, there was no place I wanted to be other than here with all of you. As a woman, RBG was one of my heroes. She played such a critical role in paving the way for women to be who we are, to step into our power, to claim our voices and offer our gifts to the world. She was brilliant and funny and sharp-witted, tough as can be, notorious RBG. I'm grieving her loss pretty hard. And then there's the question of what impact her death will have on this nation's fragile and already chaotic political landscape. I am concerned about both the short and long-term implications of this loss. I imagine you are too. I'm in this place of not knowing what to do, except actually that I've been here before in a place of shattering grief 
overwhelming anxiety, disappointment so deep it verges on panic. And in those past moments of crisis and overwhelm, the thing I've needed to do has always been the same, to gather, to come together, to be together in the grief, the confusion, whatever feelings are threatening to get in the way of our being our best selves. The first thing to do is to be with one another and allow the strength of what we create together, what we are together, pull us back from that edge. So thank you. Thank you for showing up today. I know it's not an easy time. Our reserves are getting dangerously low. My prayer is that each and every one of us find here in this time together a little bit of kindness, strength, resolve, hope, whatever it is that we need to keep on going. And I invite you now to check in via chat while I share these opening words from my colleague, the Reverend Elizabeth Mount. Come into this time bringing all you hold with you. Though your heart be heavily burdened, whether you be on the brink of tears or burn with unquenchable rage, this community can hold you and your strongest emotions. Yes, even the messy ones are welcome here. Come in if you sing just a bit too loud, if you hold still as statues and breathe it in, if you sway to the music moving your soul, you are welcome. Come in and say amen when the spirit moves you. Tell that preacher to preach. Yes, that's right, tell us. Or close your eyes and quietly let your mind float free on the blessed words. Come into this time and use it to gather up every piece of yourself. Let us be the church incarnate. Let us bring forth the spirit of all that we love by the words of our mouths and the doing of our hands as we make sacred this time together. And I invite you now to join in singing our opening hymn, Let This Be a House of Peace.
to lead us into a time of meditation today, I offer this poem by Maya Angelou, When Great Trees Fall. When great trees fall, rocks on distant hills shudder, lions hunker down in tall grasses, and even elephants lumber after safety. When great trees fall in forests, small things recoil into silence, their senses eroded beyond fear. When great souls die, the air around us becomes light, rare, sterile. We breathe briefly. Our eyes briefly see with a hurtful clarity. Our memory suddenly sharpened, examines, gnaws on kind words unsaid, promised walks never taken. Great souls die and our reality bound to them takes leave of us. Our souls, dependent upon their nurture, now shrink, wizened. Our minds, formed and informed by their radiance, fall away. We're not so much maddened as reduced to the unutterable ignorance of dark, cold caves. And when great souls die, after a period, peace blooms, slowly and always irregularly. Spaces fill with a kind of soothing electric vibration. Our senses restored, never to be the same, whisper to us. They existed, they existed. We can be, be and be better, for they existed. Let these words settle into your heart in the silence. It is tough when the bright lights go out. 
I'm thinking, of course, especially of RBG, but I'm also thinking in the last year that we've lost John Lewis, Elijah Cummings. We've lost some great musicians, John Prime, Bill Withers, Ellis Marsalis Jr. Gosh, just a week or two ago, we lost Chadwick Boseman, Black Panther. A lot of these guys are black men. And that is worth noticing and paying attention to that, that it's gonna hit uh, black, indigenous and people of color differently um, and, and closer to the bone. But you know, losing bright lights, losing public figures is different. The grief is a little bit different than, than it is when we lose someone we're close to. In some ways it's easier we don't have um, all of those daily reminders of the loss, the, the personal connections. But there's also this dimension to it. Um, these people that, you know, they're, they're larger than life. And so it feels as if they're part of the fabric of society. And when that part of the fabric gets torn away, things feel a little shaky. They feel a little shade, a, li a little frayed. You know, I think of, of a generation of little black boys, you know, Wakanda forever, and yet Wakanda's not forever, right? And I think that's true never more than now in the wake of RBG's death. Um, the fabric of society feels torn and very frayed and fragile. Uh, when I first got the news, you know, my, my brain immediately went to Roe v. Wade, to LGBTQ rights, this awareness that, you know, the family that I'm staying with right here, my sister and her wife, um, you know, their family could be at risk of discrimination. Um, and it's terrifying to me. Um, and then I thought ahead and started thinking about the election. Uh, and what happens if the results of the election are disputed somehow, and that winds up in front of a politicized Supreme Court. Um, anyway, so I spun out pretty fast. Uh, I hope I'm not the only one who did that. <laughs> I don't think it's unusual. Um, and and the fact that all of this has happened, and, and I think part of the reason it happened that, that I did spin out a little bit more than I usually would is that, you know, this is a time when I think most of us, if not all of us, feel tapped out. After six months of pandemic and balancing homeschool and, and the fear and, you know, on and on and on, it, it's reserves are low. Um, and it just seems like the hits keep coming. And, and it's almost cruel. It feels like fate is being almost cruel. Um, and yet, you know, we can't fight what's real. If we fight with reality, we will lose. Reality is reality. We can't will things to be different. Uh, if anyone could will things to be different, it would have been RBG. And she sure tried to hold out until after the election. So, you know, here we are in the wake of this latest loss, asking ourselves, well, what do we do now? What do we do? And, you know, a lot of people are sending money. There's that record breaking surge of donations. Uh, and a lot of people are doing phone banks and sending voter registration cards. Um, next Sunday, we'll have a service that, that uh, introduces you and, and lifts up the you you the vote i've been posting about that and sending it out in emails but if you haven't gotten involved yet you can learn more next sunday and all of that is well and good to do these things but it feels like a big ask to me when it comes to me um i'm tired I'm, you know there's a sense of exhaustion and then add that to a sense of being cooped up and and i know it's even worse there it finally rained so you can get outside again right which is something, which is something, yay. Um, but you know, it's, it's like, it's, it's all in our face right now, right? The fires and the smoke and boom, there's climate change. Um, you know, we're, we're less than two months out from an election and boom, there's our broken political system and the partisan division that is ripping our, our society apart. And then on top of that, boom, 
there's mortality, mortality of these great luminaries, which also reminds us that we're only mortal too. And all of this is, is two inches away from our nose and layered on top of those logistical challenges of having to change how we do everything, how we do being human. We have to find a new way of being human in the age of COVID. And, and so it feels like, you know, some days I, I wake up and I think I can't take, I can't take one more trauma. I can't take one more loss. I can't ask more of you. I can't ask more of myself. And yet we don't have a choice. We don't have a choice. This is reality. But more than that, I think we need to remember that it is precisely these kinds of situations that engender the response that's needed to transform the world. It's precisely these situations of overwhelm and frustration, of barriers and limitations that give us the impetus to become bright lives ourselves. But you don't have to take my word for it. Here's RBG. Do you have any regrets? I, I do think that I was born on, under a very bright star because you think of, of my life, I got out of law school, I have top grades, no law firm in the city of New York will hire me. I end up teaching. As I said before, they, they gave me time to devote to the movement for evening out the rights of women and men. I was not nominated to a vacancy on the Second Circuit. Instead, I was nominated to a vacancy on the D.C. Circuit. Much better place for me to be because the D.C. Circuit decides a lot of very important questions involving um, what's going on in our government. So I'll tell you what Justice O'Connor once said to me. She said, suppose we had been, we had come of age at a time when women lawyers were welcome at the bar. You know what? Today we would be retired partners from some large law firm. But because that was, route was not open to us, we had to find another way. And we both end up on the United States Supreme, Supreme Court. So what do we do? Where do we go from here? If the easy way isn't open, we have no choice. We make a new way. We make a new way. I want to share some words uh, with you from feminist theologian Carter Hayward. What are our best roles in this stunning moment as God works her purpose out a bit more dramatically for most of us than we're used to noticing? So we raise our voices? Yes, we do. Or we wait in silence? Yes, that too. Do we march? Yes, many of us must and some of us can't. Or do we sit quietly together trying to be still so that we can know more clearly what to do? If we are wise, that's exactly what we do. Do we publicly express our anger at injustice? For sure we do. Or do we gather to pray or meditate and become more mindful of the stillness of the spirit? Indeed we do. Do we insist that justice be made now, not later? Always we must. Or do we wait as justice slowly creeps in through the cracks of our lives, laws, societies? If we are savvy, that's just what we do. In this moment, we are being called to embody what Dorothy Soule named revolutionary patience. 
And because we are also nonviolent warriors for peace, we are being called to the streets, phone banks, letter writing, social media posting, personal conversations, organizing in many forms, getting out the vote. <coughs> we are being called to live all of the above usually in small measure and seldom at once, because our most effective spiritual and political work is lived in the balance. And because there are many of us, we, not just I, called to share this way of living in the world. How do we help each other keep our courage to live in the balance, to generate sacred energies with one another in this way, to embrace our we-ness, as the crucible for my I-ness. What do we do now? We keep defining the we ever more broadly so that it's not just our family and close friends, people who look like us, but our religious community, our church family, and not just our church family, but more than that, people we know, the, the people we know share our values, but the wider community with all of its flaws and complexities and people with their heads in places their heads don't belong. Not just the local community, but the national community, not the national community, but the international, and not just the human community, but the whole community of life on this planet. You see, we are people who know that everyone and everything matters. And just because not everyone is part of the we that is being called to live this truth, we can't let ourselves become discouraged because the we of people who are called to live into this bigger we, this truth of interconnectedness and interdependence is way bigger than we think. It includes Jewish people like RBG, all Jewish people who seek justice and righteousness. It includes Christian people who understand that Jesus was a radical social reformer who preached compassion over purity. It includes Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs and Buddhists and Jains and Rastafarians and pagans and more. Anyone whose spiritual beliefs pull them into the weeness that Hayward talks about, whose religious community serves as a crucible for becoming braver and kinder. It includes people with no religion at all, activists, scientists, writers, anyone who's paying attention. And none of us are perfect or pure or complete in our understanding of what needs to be done and what needs to be. Even RBG was imperfect and made mistakes that she later copped to. The thing is though, all of us who are part of this we, who are called into living a different way, are willing to learn, willing to explore, willing to love. And those forces arrayed against us that are resisting living into that we-ness, they are entrenched and they have greater access to the structures of power, including the military industrial complex. And that is scary, but you know what? We have numbers on our side, so that's one thing. But even more than that, we have reality on our side. And it feels huge because it is huge. It feels scary because it is scary and it's hard moving into an unknown and uncertain future and keeping our hearts and minds and actions in line with our own understanding of that bigger we-ness. But remember, none of us have to fix the whole world. We're just each responsible for the bits we can reach. What do we do now? First and foremost, we tend our own hearts. We show kindness and generosity. We work for justice in the ways that we can because this is who we are. This is what we do. We come to be together. We face what has to be faced and we find it easier because we are in the loving presence of our friends. We reconnect with our own goodness. We remember that we are whole in our brokenness. And then we go and we do what is right and good because we know that what we do matters. We answer that call to weeness, the call to justice, to righteousness, to peace. 
that's what we do again and again and again. So be it. And so may it be. Let's join in singing now. Woke up this morning. This morning with my mom And it was Stay on freedom Woke up this morning With my mom Our closing reading may or may not be by someone known as Molly Conway. It's been cut and pasted so many times we've lost track of its original source, but it's good stuff. So I want to share it with you now. When Jews speak of righteousness, it is never with the idea of an eternal reward. We work to be good humans to others and ourselves because justice and peace are their own rewards. We don't know what happens next, but we know what happens here. And that is enough. The pursuit of justice is one of the highest callings of Judaism, and it should not be misinterpreted as vengeance or punishment. The ideas of justice and sustainability are inextricably linked in Judaism. A system that is unjust cannot sustain, and a system that is unsustainable cannot be just. It is said that a person who passes on Rosh Hashanah is a tzedek, a good and righteous person. When we speak of tzedakah, the word is often translated as charity, but it is more accurate to say righteousness. Tzedakah can take many forms, including monetary donation, but it's important to note that tzedakah is not a benevolent contribution given to be kind or nice to those who need it. It is to be viewed as a balancing of the scales, an active working toward justice, correcting injusting justice, balancing the scales, evaluating the distribution of power and creating equity is tzedakah, the work of righteousness. When we say that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a tzedek, we don't mean she was a nice person. What we're saying is that she was a thoughtful person who worked tirelessly to create a more just world, one that would perpetuate equality and access, one that wasn't reliant on charity, one that was better for people she did not know without the expectation of praise or fame. That is what it means to be a tzedek. And I can't think of anyone who better embodies the pursuit of justice. When we say, may her memory be for blessing, the blessing we speak of is not, may we remember her fondly or may her memory be a blessing to us. The blessing implied is this. 
may you be like Ruth. Jewish thought teaches us that when a person dies, it is up to those who bear her memory to keep her goodness alive. We do this by remembering her. We do this by speaking her name. We do this by carrying on her legacy. We do this by continuing to pursue justice, righteousness, sustainability. So when you hear us say, may her memory be for blessing, don't hear, it's nice to remember her. Hear, it's up to us to carry on her legacy. When you hear us say she was a tzedek, don't hear she was a nice person. Hear she was a worker of justice. May her memory be for blessing. May her memory be for revolution. May we become a credit to her name. Amen and blessed be. Ooh, I believe in the power of kindness. Ooh, I believe in the power of love. Ooh, I believe in the power of kindness. Ooh, I believe in the power of love. We don't know what's coming, but we can help shape what's ahead. The kindness as our currency, the commonwealth is in our hands. So give a little, give a little, nah, give a lot, don't stop. A helping hand makes the world go around, there's more than enough. Ooh, I believe in the power of kindness. Ooh, I believe in the power of love, power of love. I believe in the power of kindness. Ooh, I believe in the power of love. Look up now, people, and keep your ear to the ground. We are the river flowing with generosity abound. So give a little, give a little, love, give a lot, don't stop. A helping hand makes the world go round. There's more than enough. Ooh, I believe in the power of kindness. Ooh, I believe in the power of love. Power of love. Ooh, I believe in the power of kindness. Ooh, I believe in the power of love. Honeybees are sweetness, only to help the world bloom. Bringing love to the flower, from the flower to the fruit, we can learn a thing or two. So give a little, give a little, ah, give a lot, don't stop. A helping hand makes the world go round, there's more than enough. Ooh, I believe in the power of kindness. I believe in the power of love, the power of love. Ooh, I believe in the power of kindness. Ooh, I believe in the power of love. We don't know what's coming. We can help shape what's ahead. Kindness as our currency, the commonwealth is in our hands. So give a little. Give a little love, give a lot, don't stop. A helping hand makes the world go round. There's more than enough. Ooh, I believe in the power of kindness. Ooh, I believe in the power of love, power of love. Ooh, I believe in the power of kindness. Ooh, I believe in the power of love.